time to begin our evening service. And <laughs> we're going to start a new uh, uh, series, I guess, for lack of better words. And um, I'm really, I don't try to come up with stuff that I think will just, uh, I've already scared one over here. It's not that I just intentionally try to come up with something to make people <coughs> curious, because I don't think they'll come to church unless we do. It's just I found that if you just have pure Bible studies about Jesus, people don't usually come, so you've got to juice it up just a little bit. <laughs> so, I really do believe that there's a... We're just now entering the, the, the age of... The church age where our eyes are beginning to open up and see things that we couldn't see for a long time. And if you track with church history much at all, that's what you will see. You will see that revelation knowledge is very progressive in nature. And we see more and more and more. And uh, the only conflict we have with that is because there's a part of us that gets very excited about that. And there's another part of us that, that battles when we see something that is beyond what they saw 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. And we wonder, is this right? Should we be preaching beyond what they were preaching a hundred years ago? Well, the whole, uh, the whole debacle with Jesus staying in trouble all the time was based on one thing. He was seeing more than the teachers of the law saw. And when he told them what he saw in Scripture, it caused big stinks. And that's why he was called a heretic. Because he showed them things in Scripture they hadn't seen before. So he set the standard, and now we're the Jesus people, the Jesus culture. We are the body of Christ, and he set the standard, and now every generation sees things that the generation prior to them did not see. And, uh, and there's always the first fruits of that generation that takes a few licks. I am grateful for the men and women before me that took the licks for preaching things that we preach now, and see it and run with it. But there's not too many things that we preach. I, as you know, it wasn't that many years ago, uh, 500 years ago, people were being burned at the stake for preaching grace. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I have read about the generation just prior to me, to us, that was just labeled all kinds of terrible names for preaching the kingdom of God the way that we readily preach it now. The point is this. The Bible is filled with mysterious things that generations before us looked at it, saw it, said, there's just some things we're not supposed to understand. Now, how many's ever heard that? And how many's ever heard their grandparents say, but someday... When we're up there on those streets of glory, we'll get to ask him these questions if he can explain it. Never thinking for a second, logical things like, I wonder why it's in the Bible if we're not supposed to see it and understand it. A no-brain, right? Well, what happens is, is things that we don't understand or is confusing to us, we skip over it. And actually, there's nothing wrong with that. There's mysteries in there now, many mysteries that I can't begin to wrestle with yet. Nothing that I'm going to dare try to tackle in this class, because why? Why would I try to teach something I don't understand myself? And yet, even with the mysteries we are going to tackle, they are all things that can only have spiritual explanation, which means none of us in this room can stand up and say emphatically, you just nailed that that's right. So with fear and trembling, we seek in hopes to find because I don't care how insignificant or odd a passage of Scripture may seem. It seems like I remember somewhere somebody saying in the Bible, all Scripture is God breathed and there must be something in it. Now, I want to show you a passage of Scripture. Tonight, we're going to lay foundation. We're we're, we're going to have a little bit of fun towards the end here with, 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 some, with some little sample packs. Um, but after tonight, we're going to take a, a passage of Scripture that has always been mysterious, uh, that has made people go, hmm, and scratch their head, and we're going to jump into it and see if we can see what's in there. How many's ever watched any of those shows? Uh, what's the name of uh, Well, Unsolved Mysteries. That's, that's a show, right? I mean, it's not about the Bible, I don't guess, but... 
and they try to solve the mysteries of life. That's what we're going to do because there's something there. Now, Matthew chapter 11, we're going to try to set a, a foundation tonight for where we're going and how we're going to approach it. And Matthew 11 is like the perfect place to begin because Jesus is dealing with the very fact that he and John the Baptist were both prophesied. They were both written about in Scripture. It was as plain as the nose on your face. At least God was thinking that it was evidently when he had the prophets write about them. And yet, chapter 11 deals with the fact that when John the Baptist came, the one who would be Elijah coming back, um, according to Jesus at least. I hear people still saying, I wonder who Elijah's going to be. It's like, Jesus, if you read the Gospels, Jesus told you. That's not the only time that we do stuff like that, by the way. There's many times. I mean, look at, look at Acts chapter 2 with that scary stuff happening on the day of Pentecost. And, you know, the sun being dark and the moon turning to blood. And you got all kinds of paperback novelists out there turning that into nuclear holocaust. Even after Peter said, here is the explanation of that scripture. <laughs> we don't know the Bible, I guess. We don't read it. Jesus is using this as a case in point. It was written about in scripture. It was made very plain. And though it was very obvious, there should have been... The natural mind, the human intellect, the carnal heart can't see the things of God. And so he's talking about that. And if I just pick it up at like verse 18, Jesus is saying, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right. By her actions. Uh, look, he's not always going to use wisdom in a, through a good light here. It's human intellect, especially. But he's, he's saying, look, these things were written about. They were fulfilled. They were standing in front of your face. And you called it everything except for what it was. Now, how often do we do that in Scripture? I've done that in Scripture. Lord, I, I don't know about you, but... but I'm a little further down the road than I was five years ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago. I've told you before, I've stood in pulpits and preached things that, that if I heard someone preaching some of that stuff now, I'd be like, get away. I preached out of my infancy. I preached out of my immaturity. I, I preached out of my lack of understanding. It's just the way life is. It's, it's not a big deal. As long as you're growing, it's not a big deal. He's saying it was right in front of your face, and you called it everything but what it was. Verse 20, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. In other words, when they saw something right in front of their face, it didn't really move them or change them. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for, for Tyr and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. And at that time, Jesus said, in other words, I read that to give context. To what Jesus is about to say. It was at that time within the framework of what is going on. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And so... We see in this passage that human wisdom and intellect can't see God. They can't see the things of God. Can't seeing God literally means when they read the words of God, because God is invisible. This is the visibility of God. They see this, but they can't see it. They can't see what's in it. And he's saying even when something becomes tangible, 
a miracle right in front of your face. A human being that's been prophesied and described to every little detail right in front of your face. You still are blind. You can't see God. You can't see the things of God. And Jesus uh, then reminds us, Father, you have hidden things from the carnal man, from human intellect and human wisdom. And you're only revealing them to your children. And then he says something very important. He says, you know, Father, the only one that really knows me is you, and the only one that really knows you is me. Oh, and the ones that I'm in revealing you to. And so he's trying to tell us, unless he, the spirit of Jesus Christ, quickly, just for a second, attach the last book of, of the Bible to that as a little addendum to that remark, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The only one that can see God and the things of God is those that the Son is inside, and He's revealing them. We can't do it because we're smart. You can't go to a school somewhere and, and, and see the deep mysteries of God because you took 52 classes. It's good. I, I'm very grateful for Bible college. I'm, I'm grateful for seminary. It taught me how to study. It taught me how to, to collect things and put them together and see God's systems and see the redundancies of God. It gave me the tools. It opened my eyes and taught me how to see God. But when I finished school, I, I didn't see 99% of the things that I currently see concerning God. Things that I preach, I didn't, there's nothing I preach here that I learned in school. But the Spirit of Christ that's in you and in me, if we allow Him, He will show us these things. Only through the Son can we see the Father. And when I say we see the Father, we see Him through His Word. The Bible is a portrait of God. I want you to think about that. That'd be something good to write down and remember. The Word of God is the portrait of God. It's the picture of God. It's all we have of Him. It is God's self-portrait. And we see from the story that miracles do not reveal Him. Miracles, tangible things we see. Miracles do not reveal him to the carnal man. But isn't it interesting that words can? I mean, doesn't the carnal mind say that, that a, a, a visible, physical miracle should be more powerful than words in a book? And yet it's just the opposite. Jesus is saying, you know, these cities that he did the most miracles in, they seem to be the most lost, the most blind. The most incapable of seeing God. And yet words can reveal him. Which is why faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And it's why that all through the Bible you see incredible miracles. I mean in Moses, the Moses generation saw the greatest collection of miracles that was ever seen. And yet they became a depraved generation that literally had to die in the wilderness because God couldn't use them for their lack of faith. But they saw things even beyond, you know, it was, it was amazing enough to see the things that Jesus did. I mean, few people witnessed him walking on water, just that handful. Um, but many saw him raise the dead. Many saw him do many works of healing. But think of the, the magnitude of the miracles that upwards of two million people all saw at the same time in the wilderness. The sea party. Manna coming from heaven, a, a river of water coming out of, out of a, a, a cliff. I mean, incredible things. Victories over armies that had, had iron and bronze, and they had farm tools at best. And yet they were seeing incredible things. And it didn't change anything. And yet the words of God, which are simply just words to some, to some their philosophy history and morals for living, principles, guidelines. To other people, they open this book and they begin to read and they see things and the mysteries of God unfold in a way that transforms their life. How can words change how somebody thinks and how somebody acts, changes their personality and their demeanor and their temperament? And isn't that amazing, the power of words when the words begin to be revealed as more than words? So, the context of God, because God is, that's a very, that's a very subjective word, isn't it? 
God. That can mean many things to many people, and it does mean many things to many people, and many people have many gods. But God, the creator of the heaven and earth, the context of who God is, is found in the content of God. This right here. The context of who God is, is found completely in the content of God's word. The trick, though, is that it's all wrapped up in parables, types, shadows, prophetic imagery, stories, and history that Paul says are given for spiritual illustration, which means you have to take literal history lessons and somehow they have to be spiritualized. It's filled with codes, relatable reference points that mean more than what they appear. Um, as, as God teaches us the meaning of what it means to be a mother, a father, a husband, a bride, a child, uh, gold, fire. Relatable reference points that mean more than what they mean in the natural. The redundancies of God within those types and shadows and, and, and codes and, and relatable reference points that, that through the redundancy we begin to see the picture of who God is as God comes from a thousand different angles back to the same point revealing himself. The context of who God is is found in the content of God but not everybody can see it. If you can't see it, you can't believe it. So, Here's a question. When are the mysteries in here, when are the mysteries to us intentionally made mysteries by God? That's where we first have to begin. Because some people would read through this book and say, you know what, I've been studying this for years. I found 12 passages that truly are mysteries and I can't make heads or tails of it. There's someone else that said, you know what, Every other verse was a mystery. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. So the question is, is when are the mysteries to us also mysteries to God? And what I mean by that, when is it something that very intentionally by God has been hidden? Because he did not want it to be that obvious. He skated over something real quick. He, as some of you that's been in this walk for a long time, you know there are... More than one place in the Bible where it's telling a story, it drops a one-liner, maybe two sentences about something that just came out of the blues, just something mind-blowing, and quickly it returns back to the story. And you go, whoa, 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 back up. You know, Jesus is on the cross and he's being crucified and, and he's saying it's finished and the sky is dark and there's a little rumbling in the earth. And all of a sudden the graves of Jerusalem burst open and dead people were walking around everywhere. And then the people were crying. They were sad that Jesus was gone. And they took him and they put him in the tomb. It's like, whoa, whoa, back up. What, what was that about? About zombies again? Those places are in the Bible. When is a mystery to us also a mystery to God? Because it might be a mystery to us just because of our biblical illiteracy, illiteracy our, our immaturity. And sometimes we make the obvious mysterious just because we haven't grown to that point yet. But what about the places in the Bible where you studied and you're just filled with revelation knowledge and you still encounter places that's like, what is that about? And then we have to decide, well, is that also God breathed? Is that a message of God? Has that been intentionally hidden? And when something, I believe something has been intentionally hidden by God, it doesn't make me want to skate over it. It makes me start thinking things like, hmm, there must be something really good in that. And God told me if I would seek, I would find. If he sees I'm hungry and I'm searching for truth here, he's not playing head games with me. He wants me to see that, but it's not going to be easy. This is going to be based on desire, on hunger. And I believe God has put mysteries in there to test us in our hunger, to test us in our desire. A lot of this stuff is easy. Some people are happy with easy. Some people 
need to settle with easy because their mind is blown too much and they get too confused. There's, I told you something, there's a reason why X percentage of people leave the seminary unbelievers. <laughs> because they just went from milk to major meat. And they weren't raised in a way where they knew how to wrap their minds around the meat. And it blew their minds. And it was easier just to walk away from it than to try to understand it. There are times God, I believe, is intentionally covert. I believe that because I just read you a passage where Jesus said that. He said, yeah, I tell stories and parables all the time. I do that because the human intellect doesn't have a clue what I'm talking about. But he said, but my children understand. It's been revealed to them. Most of you that have been um, walking with God and, and a student of the word for a while, you can read every parable in here and you could sit down as good as me or anybody else and do a teaching on most of these parables that Jesus told. Because you see them, you understand them. It's been revealed to you. It makes sense to you. But the world reads them and they go, this just doesn't make It's like Aesop's fables is how they look at it. Well, there's a, little, there's a moral in here somewhere. And they'll take something like even like the prodigal son. And as you know, God's word is like an onion. It's got many layers. And they'll see the top layer or two of the onion. But, you know, if you've been around here for a while, we have told facets of that story that most people have never thought about that really end up being the main plot line to the movie. God intentionally does it that way and he rewards hunger and desire. If I say, God, I want to know you more than I, want, than I know you right now. How many of you guys would say that with me and say, say God, I want to know you more than I know you right now. I think most of us in here, we clearly say that. But what's the, what's the response to that? To get down on our knees and, until they're black and blue or raw or blistered and we can't stand it anymore. We're just waiting for more, show me more. It's, and we're waiting on just this revelation to fall out of the sky. Or could it be true that God has made clear that this is his portrait? Yeah, I, I like experiencing the goosebumps. I love it when I'm feeling his presence in worship. But I want you to understand there's a difference between feeling God's presence and knowing God. I can know God's presence and not know God any more than I knew him before I was just in his presence. I love what happens in his presence. It's, it's very vital to my livelihood, actually. But I don't come out of his presence suddenly in that moment, understanding deep revelation. The deep revelation is in here. And now what his presence can do is provoke that spirit to shine its light, I guess, on things that I couldn't see before. But this is it. If I say I'm hungry for God, this is the feeding trough. Jesus was laid in a manger, a feeding trough. It was imagery that if you're hungry for God, there's only one way to God. It's through Jesus Christ, the one in the feeding trough. And Jesus said, the only ones that can know God is me and the ones that I am in, that I reveal him to. It's all about the word. And we live in times now where many wonderful things are happening in the body of Christ. But I fear we're still too much like the dark ages of the church. We're still content with just going to church and letting, uh, letting the teacher get up and say, I'm going to read a scripture and we're going to talk about it today. And that's all the word we get. Do you realize how slow the progression of, of your view of God is going to be if that's all that you ever do? If the only word you get is when you're at Cornerstone Family Church, you're on a very slow train to seeing God. In fact, I feel like our main job here is to, is to take the word and use it as examples of what you can see if you will get into it. But the, the deepest things I've seen of God that I have not seen in a church service. I love going to conferences and I take notebooks full of notes when I'm at conferences. And it's, 
It's hardly ever anything the speaker says. It's things you hear the Spirit say in between the lines. Y'all know what I'm saying? And you come home with all this stuff and you go, I don't, don't think he said any of this, but boy, I sure heard somebody saying this stuff. And then you come home and you look at it and you get in the Word and it, it, it trains your mind and it teaches you to see. It gives you vision. And then you get in the Word and God starts showing you things. And suddenly when it's personal, it means more. Authors of the Bible, they can be vague through accident, or they can be vague by God's design. There are mysterious passages in the Bible that you read and you go, what in the moon is he talking about? One of the things that I tell you now we're going to be hitting one night is uh, in Genesis, this, the mystery of the Ben Elohim and the Nephilia. How many know what I'm talking about? There's giants in the land, and I don't care. Who in the moon are these Ben Elohim and what are they doing with the daughters of the earth? And what is this offspring? <laughs> well, as far as anyone knows, Moses wrote that. Um, was Rose, was Roses, yeah. Was Moses accidentally vague with that just because he had knowledge about some of that and, and he's just like coasting along and he's writing and, uh, and it's like, yeah, and, uh, because he just... He assumed the reader would have all the knowledge that he had maybe and it wasn't that mysterious. So was he accidentally vague about that? Or was God intentionally using a man in retrospect to write something that was not there to personally witness it? Was God intentionally having that written the way it was to be vague? Because there was something hidden in that that he wanted us to see. And he didn't want just anyone to see it. He only wanted his kids to see it. And not just any of his kids, but the kids that were hungry to see. The kids that were ready to see something there. Hmm. You know, uh, Pastor Scott, Proverbs 25, and verse 2 says, It is God's privilege to conceal things, and the king's privilege to discover them. That's good. He's put them there. He, he kept it hidden from us so we can never find them. He's exactly. put them there for us to discover them. Exactly. They're not hidden to keep us from, it's, it's hidden to secure it for us. It's good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, some things are hidden for us to seek, and some things are hidden just because God's done with it. That's where we're going to separate a few little issues here of some things we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come and some things we're not going to be looking at. There are some mysteries of the Bible that are hidden literally, not just in Scripture, but somewhere in planet Earth, literally hidden because God is done with it. Ain't no sense chasing the mystery. God's done with it. You can chase it the rest of your life and you ain't going to find the answers. And there's other things that as... As Mike just read, they are hidden so that they can be found. Some things are hidden because God's done with it. We just finished uh, last last class. We just finished our uh, that our creation study, and you know we talked about the garden in Eden, and we talked a little bit about the location of the garden in Eden, and and you know a lot of people much smarter than me have really researched that and. And they have really done their homework. And it really has, it has been really recent, just the last few years, um, that some, uh, what would I call them? Not exactly scientists, adventurers, theologians, these guys that would be the hodgepodge of all the above, I guess, really has, has went on a, a, an adventure and put things together where you can look at it and you can finally safely say, here was the location of the garden in Eden, and yep, it's hidden. Because when they finally found the two other rivers that don't literally exist right now, we know the Tigris and the Euphrates do, but those fords of the river gathered with two other rivers, um, and they all came in together at one place, and they didn't know what the other two rivers were. Even if they changed names, historically they could never find proof of that. But satellite imagery has changed everything. Because did you know what, from satellites, you can look at dry, barren regions, and you can see where every river used to be? And they found the other two rivers. 
And one is, one is, is coming out of Iran from the side. The other is coming out of Saudi Arabia. They're coming right there. Here comes the other two rivers are coming. And guess where they all met? Right in the middle of where the Red Sea is right now, the Persian Gulf. Right in the middle of it. Because it was only like 4,000 years ago that water tables raised and filled uh, five, meant 5,000 years ago. I don't remember the timetable now. But it, 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 was, it was early in history that uh, the water levels changed. Scientists have documented it all over the earth. They've been able to do measurements and prove here's where the water levels used to be. The water levels raised. Now there's water here. There didn't used to be water there. Uh, there um, and they look at that and they say 5,000 years ago, there was no water where the Persian Gulf is right now. It was lower. And when the water levels raised, it pushed water up into where, as a basin, into the Persian Gulf. And now, where those four rivers came together, you can't see it. It's covered. Do you know why that happened? Because God was done with it. Do you think it would be profitable if the Garden in Eden physically existed? Do you think that would be profitable to us? Let's take something else. The, but any ark. Seems like anything that was an ark has gotten hidden, huh? Noah's Ark. They look and they look on Mount Ararat, and of course the, the wording is, is tricky because it, it literally can mean the mountains around Ararat. And uh, satellite imagery they thought would help there, but when every time they, they thought they found it was satellite imagery, it ended up not being that. And then there's a, a group of <coughs> adventurers from China just a few years ago that said they did find it. They have video footage where they're down inside the ark walking around and you can see the rooms and everything. But lo and behold, they haven't been back and they won't tell anybody where it is. But they say, yeah, we found it. And I'm thinking, ah, I doubt that. You're not just going to find something like that and go back home and say, ah, let's go sled riding tomorrow. We're done with that. Let's, nah. So, and so nobody really believes them. But you, you guys know, team after team, they can't find it. Well, that was just a few years ago. I'm not sure what would be left of it anyway. I mean, it is wood, right? Take the Ark of the Covenant. The last record of the Ark of the Covenant was in 2 Kings. It was uh, the last mention of it was about 40 years uh, before uh, Babylon raided Jerusalem and took all of its treasures. And then they returned and they ended up burning the temple and everything that was left in the temple. I assure you, they did not leave the Ark of the Covenant there. So either the Ark of the Covenant was taken uh, by the Babylonians and melted down for the gold, or uh, when the Babylonians were coming, the priests did what would be common for priests to do, and they would take the sacred articles of God and they would hide them somewhere. Suffice it to say, Everybody's looking and nobody finds it, right? Would it be good if we found it? Don't open it. Yeah, don't open it. Well, I don't know. Indiana Jones found it. Stupid crowd opened it. Everybody got fried. They hid it again. Let me, give you a, let me give you a last example of how God hides things and to prove to you he has no intentions of it ever being found again. How many ever read about the bones of Moses? And so we have the story of Moses dying. God takes him up on Mount Nebo and he shows him over to the promised land so that God can keep his promise because God's going to keep his promise. He's yay and amen. And he shows somehow he gives Moses the ability to see every little region, every little area in Canaan so God can say, hey, dude, you failed, but I'm going to keep my word. I said you were going to see it. Here it is. Look at it. And then he died. Okay. And it's very mysterious because it says that he died and it makes it appear that God buried him somewhere and it and it definitely says that no man knew of the burial site and now we've got this really really strange strange story in Jude Jude is nothing but strange we could spend 
two months just in June. It's some weird, wild, wacky stuff. We find it here. The very same way these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring slanderous accusation against him, which is all beside the point. The point for now is that Michael the archangel and Satan were arguing over Moses' bones. Now, let's just put our thinking caps on. God has hidden Moses. The Bible's very clear. God hid Moses' body so nobody would find it. The devil's trying to get it and bring it back into play. You tell me, what, what's the plot line there? Why did God do that? Why did the devil want to uncover his bones, bring them back into the picture? What was the, what was the people's single biggest problem in life that kept coming between them and God. Idolatry. Thank you. Idolatry. Is there any chance these people that quickly would make images out of gold with their own hands and then like idiots turn around and worship what they just made with their own hands. Is there any chance these people would worship Moses' bones? Especially years after the fact when the memory is always more romantic than the reality. Case in point, JFK. The history and the memory is always more romantic than what that reality actually was. Tim and I, at lunch today, we were talking some politics, and, and then we just finally said, this is unproductive. Let's just change the subject. <laughs> um, and I remember well. Ronald Reagan, he was the man. I love that guy, mostly because I like Bobo, his monkey from the old movies. Man, some of y'all remember, when he was first elected, he wasn't considered it that great. He barely got in. He was reelected with a landslide, but this dude barely got in, and he, he was controversial, and he took a lot of flack, and but our, our memory, and he did become a, a great president, like we haven't seen since. But people forget the parts that weren't so glamorous. And uh, I'm wondering if we don't know when Michael the Archangel and Satan were squabbling over the bones. We don't know that. But suffice it to say, it was potentially generations later. And now you've got this story, this history of the great Moses. What would happen? if we found the Ark of the Covenant? Would that be an attraction or a distraction to the body of Christ? A body that has been set free from law, and now we find a box that's holding the law? Would that potentially uh, be a stumbling block to the message of grace? See, even today, we have trouble with idolatry. There's a story in the Old Testament, I can't remember exactly where it is, but it, it's so strange because um, the people were in idolatry and God was upset because they were even taking the things of God and making them idols. I mean, we would never do that with crosses or anything like that. How many ever slept with a cross under their pillow to protect you from bad things or... I mean, treated it like it was a magic wand or something. I mean, sure, it keeps vampires away, but demons? <laughs> Point is, there are some things God hides because he's done with it. But those things become very obvious. It's very obvious. God says it's counterproductive for that, for that garden to still be here. Why? Because after the fact, the significance of the Garden of Eden was only spiritual. The natural was done. It served no purpose anymore. In fact, it would become a distraction to what God is trying to do. An ark that saved humanity. There's no chance that we would ever take splinters of that, of those boards and, 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 and somehow we would end up selling them and, 
uh, and uh, marketing them as, as miracle splinters now is there. We put it right there on the shelf with our miracle healing water from the Jordan River. We dabble in white witchcraft all the time as Christians and we don't even realize it because it's disguised with religion and we don't see it. Man is prone to witchcraft. Man is prone to idolatry. And God, when he's finished with some things, he hides them. Um, and you can search as much as you want, but you won't find it. Idols always got between God and his people. Hidden things meant to be found will be found, and they will build our faith. Um, I love the parable uh, that Jesus was always telling stories, parables about the kingdom, and uh, such as the pearl, the great pearl, the pearl of great price. And, and uh, a farmer is out um, in his, in, in his uh, field, and it's not really even his field. It appears it's a borrowed field or a rented field that he's farming and he's plowing, he's digging, all of a sudden he unearths this great pearl. Now what the pearl's doing out in the middle of the field, I have no idea. But the Bible says he went, he hid the pearl back in the field and he went back and he sold everything that he had so he could come back and buy that field. His point was that when you find, that when you search and you dig something up and you find something of great value, you're willing to relinquish everything else that you ever had to grab hold of that. And that's the way the mysteries of the Bible are. The deep revelations of, of Jesus and his kingdom. It's just, that's why the revelation of Jesus Christ was supposed to be a great encouragement to God's people. Not a great scare tactic. Hidden things are meant to be found. And they build our faith when we see them. Endless mysteries in the Bible. Things that we will try to figure out. What's going on here? The Ben Elohim and the Philia. Ezekiel 28 with the guardian cherubim. One of the most mysterious, misunderstood passages in the Bible. Um, that if we don't see, we're going to miss something really important. Daniel 70 weeks. If we don't see that for what it is, we not only will miss something now, we will not be able to look back and see what we were supposed to see prior to now. The tombs bursting open in Jerusalem. Is there something hidden in there that maybe we need to see? Was that something that God intentionally made vague for people later on to say, okay, we're not going to skip this anymore. Let's go back now. We're better armed, and let's just see if there's something God has in that for us that's very important. Um, but Job is full of mysteries. Not necessarily the behemoth. I don't think there's a lot of mystery. There's some things we've made more mysterious than they're supposed to be. I mean, a hippo wasn't always called a hippo. An elephant wasn't always called a hippo. Elephant. A crocodile leviathan was not always called a crocodile. Some of those things were never supposed to be mysterious, and we've made them mysterious. But there are things in the, the beginning of, of Job that just out of the blue. God says, let me tell you a story. Well, I was having a meeting, and I call all the sons of God to come together, and Satan was there, and we're over here, and we're trying to say, whoa, 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 back up. Who was there? What's going on in this conversation? It's mysteries. The mystery of the last trumpet. What's really going on with that besides the childish little things we've turned it into? Is there something deeper there than what we've seen? Is there more to the mansions and the streets of gold and the infantile things we've reduced them to. <laughs> the curses. I think there's a lot of things about curses we need to see because if we don't see unveil the mysteries of these curses, then we can be walking these curses out, not even realizing what's going on in our life. And at the same time, in fear of something that is more of an imagination than reality. What are some of the things that some of you guys have looked at in the Bible and you said, man, that's just a real mystery. I, I don't understand that. We, I wish somebody would talk about that. What, what are some of them that we can maybe add to the list? Besides the Ben Elohim. It's the one everybody wants to talk about. Well, maybe you guys have figured it all out, so I'll come up with my own list. I'll just share the mysteries to me with you then how about that? Because I ain't got it all figured out. <laughs> so we'll do it this way. 
We're going to solve mysteries in the way that mysteries are solved. And it's a three-prong approach. First of all, you observe. I like Sherlock Holmes with his big magnifying glass out. Why has he got a magnifying glass? Because he's looking for details that can't be seen with the natural eye. Now behold, there's a mystery right there. Something I just said to you. There are things that can't be seen with the natural eye. And so we're going to get God's magnifying glass out, his Holy Spirit, and we're going to observe. The second step of solving mystery after you observe is you, you're looking for clues. You're gathering evidence. And there is no evidence, no evidence in any story, in any mystery in the Bible, that there is not redundancy all through the Bible showing you that same thing. It just isn't as mysterious as that. It's just that the way that was presented as a mystery, that if you can see it, there's something supernatural about when you see a mystery of God, you just saw a new part of God, and it does something in your life. It's, I can't explain it. It just does. You observe, you look for clues, and then you piece it together. You piece the clues together. You piece the clues together using codes that you know already exist, types and shadows that you know already exist, um, and, and you piece it all together. Um, you observe, you gather clues, and um, you put them together through the filter of who you already know that God is. And that's, that's a very important um, element of, of hermeneutics. Um, it's supposed to be understood as a basic principle. There is nothing in the Bible that should just stand out glaringly alone that has nothing to do with any other part of the Bible. In fact, uh, seminary teachers will tell you that if there's something in the Bible that you have pulled out and it stands very much alone and it doesn't really seem to have continuity with anything else in the Bible, you will know right up front you missed it. You got it wrong. What you see is not what it is because it goes against the very nature of God who is very redundant in nature, um, just like you are as parents. You all have however many things that we're trying to teach our kids, a dozen things that are foundational, many little offshoots, but we're trying to teach them a dozen different things that are very important. And um, every one of those things, we come from many different angles, and we say it many different ways, and we use, we, we use teaching moments every time we can. And there's never going to be a time in our life that suddenly one day when our child is 13 years old, four months and three days, that that day we're going to suddenly tell them something they've never heard before. It's going to be mind-blowing. It's just going to shock them and they're going to be standing there and then we're going to move on and we're never going to talk about it again. You see? Now I've got some mysteries left to reveal for Hannah. And I've told you that. And I tell her it's a baby. When we sat down, we're getting closer by the day. She's sixth grade. I wanted to wait till seventh grade, but some lunatic decided the sixth graders should be born in the seventh and eighth graders now instead of an elementary school where they're supposed to be. So they're fast tracking my child. I'm not happy about it, but it is what it is. So I may have to move up our little talk. And I've told her, I said, baby, I'm telling you now, when you and I have this talk, when I get done, you're just going to be sitting there. Your eyes are going to be this big. Your mouth is going to be open. And somewhere along the way, all you're going to say is, Stop, Daddy. Don't tell me anymore. Because I said, It's going to blow your little Chinese mind. Because <laughs> you can have your imagination of where babies come from and how babies are made. But when you find out the truth, it's just not as good as the imagination. <laughs> And you just said, I don't want to hear this. Um, and after I have that talk with her, it's going to open the door. And then we're going to have many follow-up conversations on that as she grows older. There's never going to be a point where I just tell her something shocking and then move on. God's not going to do that to his children either. But it doesn't mean that with each mystery, even though it's something redundant, there might be a new depth to it. And sometimes it's not even about seeing something that's not already seen somewhere in Scripture. It's just about God wanting to, to show you He is spirit. And the fact that you just saw that, which was very spiritual, you and Him are connecting. You are hearing Him. You are seeing things. And He wants you to be encouraged by that. Because that all opens the door for God then to begin to, begin to speak to you in that still, small voice 
in, in ways that the pagans out there can't relate to. In fact, they think we're crazy when we talk about it. God can speak to your heart and show you things very mono-mono, but it's things that sound like him already. And it's never going to be things that you'll that you wonder, was that God or was that the devil? Was that just my imagination? I'm just so confused here. No, because Adam knew the sound of God walking in the garden. And in this garden here, God teaches you what he sounds like. And seeing some of these mysteries is going to be more than just for recreational purposes on Wednesday night to try to get you to come. There's a much bigger purpose behind this. I want us to have fun with it, and I want us to kick it around, and I, and I want to hear your all's thoughts on some of these things. No one's going to scold you if, if, if I don't agree with you or someone else doesn't agree with you, because these are mysteries for a reason. It may take a collective of the body of Christ to even reason some of this stuff out. You know what I mean? You guys say things all the time around me that I go, whoa, that was good. I need to write that down. So we'll do it together, okay? All right. And in the meantime, if there's something that you were not brave enough to shout out tonight, an area that you just always wondered about, it was very puzzling, it was very mysterious to you, um, write that down. Hand it to me on Sunday or something. Just trust me, you will not be the only one. You will represent many with that same wonderment. All right? Which fish swallowed Jonah? Which fish swallowed Jonah? <laughs> my guess is it was a sperm whale, is my guess. <laughs> some things, there's a good case in point, though. There is something that's, that some, some people say, well, tell me, what's the deal with this big fish? Y'all do understand that in those days, they did not know that whales were mammals, right? So what was a whale to them? It's a big fish. I'm not saying God didn't prepare a big fish literally like the only one that existed like that. God can do whatever he wants, clearly. But also understand, not everything is a huge mystery. It was just a mystery to them. But it wouldn't be a mystery to us, okay? Um, yeah, I, I can't tame the Leviathan. I'm, I'm not going to pet a crocodile. Most men won't. The, the crocodile hunter would, but others would, but I wouldn't. Um, God can, clearly. He said, I can. Can you? Uh, but yeah, the, the great fish, for me, there's not a mystery there because yeah, I don't know how many whales eat people, but... If God prepared, that meant God programmed that thing to be in the right place at the right time and to swallow him. And whatever swallowed him was not like a shark where it took bites and chunks and ate him in little pieces. Could have been a whale shark. Could have been a whale shark. <laughs> but there's some big honking. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because it just so happens we're going to be talking about Jonah on Sunday morning. Jonah is the perfect story of human free will. It's in the midst of God's sovereignty. It is the perfect, perfect story. And every one of y'all are going to see yourselves in that story. And we're all going to go, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> all right, are they having Christmas play practice? See, I'm, I'm programmed for Christmas play practice. All right, I'm done. Y'all done? Okay, let's do something before we leave. something else. This was something. Let's, I just want, I want to just uh, together just uh, kind of bless this, this men's power advance this weekend. These times are so important. Um, they're special. They're different from Sunday mornings. They're different from Wednesday nights. They're different from when we're alone. Um, they're, they're special times, the men's power advances. And you ladies who went on the women's power advances, you guys always come back with big red eyes and Big bags under there and we've been crying all weekend. Y'all go down there and cry, we go down there and fart. It's just a difference, you know. It's just... I told my wife and I said, see, I said, I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a, 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 a big old uh, big old uh, pan of uh, of Italian baked beans. And she said, Really? I said, Yeah, people love those beans. She said, Think about it. I said, What? Uh, the obvious is she said, how many guys are you going to have down there? 
in a cabin, in a room, eating baked beans. <laughs> Said, I got spray on my list. We'll be good. We'll have the fireplace going. It'll, it'll vaporize everything. This is what happens when you get a bunch of guys together. I know you women don't do anything like that, but you all are crying. You talk about Jesus, and everybody gets, you know, all blessed and everything. We're more real than that, okay? Okay, how, how do we make that a segue into calling down the fire of the Holy Spirit on this weekend? <laughs> Father, we love you. And we're so grateful for freedom tonight. So grateful for your grace. It abounds so much beyond our frailty, our failures, our weakness, our sin. Thank you tonight, Lord, for this new season that we're launching here. And, um, wet our appetites with this, Lord, to seek you and to see you, to understand you. Teach us, Lord, to become comfortable, to grapple with you, to, to wrestle with the messenger, and to wrestle with the message until we've been blessed. This weekend, Lord, is a, it's a special time. A bunch of men of God getting together, getting real. Getting real in ways that we can't get real in any other venue in life. Men in an arena where they can finally be vulnerable. Without judgment. Without shame. And Lord, it's an opportunity for you just to do something incredible in us. In us as men, Lord, and then... The ripple effect into our marriages and into our families. The ripple effect into, into Cornerstone Family Church. The ripple effect into this town, this area. And we just give this week into you, Lord. Every part of it. Every conversation, every session. Um, the private conversations that go on, Lord, late at night in different cabins. And Lord, just those God-ordained times. Pray, Lord, it'll be a cleansing time. It'll be a healing time. And it'll be a time that we're built up and that we're supercharged to come back and be the sons of God, the men of God that you predestined us to be. Be glorified, Lord, in all this, the whole weekend, Father. As we step into deeper waters, Lord, of what it means to have free will in the midst of your sovereignty Sunday morning, give us a revelation of that, Lord. Help us to get all this. Thank you for those that came tonight. And may they just go home, Lord, feeling just your love in their life. I know you appreciate that they came tonight and they brought their families. May they, may they sense that appreciation. And that's all I can think to say right now. But I'll probably talk to you later on when I do my now laying me down to sleep. So.